My dear respected brothers in Islam, the first three years of Islam after the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received revelation from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that first period, da'wah was performed in secret. What this means is that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers would gather in a specific house by themselves, not in public, and they would make sure that no one knows where they were. And when the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would perform da'wah, he would perform da'wah on an individual basis. He wouldn't go out in public and call people to Islam. So in this period, Islam or the da'wah itself was performed in secret. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commanded the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the believers to go out in public and perform da'wah. And as soon as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam received this revelation, he went to a nearby mountain or like a hilly area where if anyone had an announcement and they wanted to make this announcement to the people in Quraysh, they would go to this mountain or they would go to this, this um, elevated area. And where the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he made his first proclamation public uh, proclamation that he is the Prophet and everyone needs to follow him and he is warning them from a, uh, a severe punishment that will come towards them. And Abu Lahab, we all know uh, the, the story. And Abu Lahab, he went and turns to the Prophet, he turns to the Prophet Muhammad and he says, Tabban laka. He says, is this the reason why you have gathered us today in this, in this gathering? So you can tell us about this information. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he reveals the verse, Tabbat yada abi lahabin wa tab. That's not the part, inshallah, that I'm going to be speaking about. What I'm going to be speaking about is this proclamation that became public now. The people of Quraysh were very, very scared. To the point they started to think and ponder. How are we going to allow a man by the name of Muhammad to walk around in the streets of Mecca and perform his da'wah and we know that this message is very powerful and Hajj is going to come up very soon. The Hajj period was going to come up. It was only around the corner. And they said, how are we going to allow this when there's different tribes that are going to come to Mecca right now and they're going to perform the Hajj because they used to perform Hajj even previous to Islam, you know, before Islam, but they used to perform it incorrectly. How are we going to allow this to occur? And then the Arabs will then revolt. So they said, we have to get together. They gathered all of the chiefs of, of the people of Quraysh. And the head of them was Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira. And he says to every single one of them, tell me, what do you think of this man, Muhammad? So they can come out as a counter narrative to the Prophet Muhammad's message. One of them said, we can call him a kahin, a fortune teller. And so Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he started to think and he pondered and he started to think of what a kahin does, a fortune teller. He says, I know what fortune tellers do. This man's not a fortune teller. So another person says, we can call him a majnoon. We call him a crazy person. And then Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he says, I've witnessed people who are crazy, who have dipped into insanity, then come back out, come back out into sanity. This person is not a crazy man. So another person says, well, why don't we call him a sha'ir? We call him a poet. You know, those words that come out of his mouth, it's beautiful. So they say, we call him a poet. So Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he started to think and he pondered. He says, Sha'ir, a poet. He says, I know what poets do. They say words that come out of their mouth, but it's not truthful. The only reason why they're saying it is because it's eloquent and it makes them look good. So he's not a poet. He means what he's saying. So another person, he says, fine, we call him a sahir. We call him a magician. So Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira, he thinks and he ponders again. And he says, sahir, magician. I've come across magicians. This person is not a magician. He cannot be called a magician. So then they all turned around to Al-Walid ibn al-Mughira and they said to him, okay, what would you call him then? We've given you all of this. What would you say about him? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he makes mention of what happened in the Quran. And he says, innahu fakkara wa qaddar. He, 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 he thought and he contemplated. He killed himself because of how hard he was, was thinking and pondering. The verses continue to say that the point, يعني, he started to frown because of how hard he was thinking. What can we call Muhammad? What can we call his message? How are we going to stop his da'wah? What's the counter narrative? And he came up and he says, okay, fine. This is what we're going to say. We're going to say that this man is a sahir. He's a magician. Why is he a magician? 
Because when he comes with his message, he splits between the father and the son because one of them would have accepted Islam. He splits between the mother and the daughter. He splits between family members because one of them will accept Islam and the other one won't. So, excellent idea. This is what they said. Now, the Hajj period came. And this was their counter-narrative. This man, he will come across as you are performing your rituals for Hajj. His name is Muhammad. Beware of him. He is a magician. Do not listen to him. He was split between your family members. And this is what they warned all of the Arabs when they came for the Hajj period. Now, it is narrated when the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was performing his da'wah in that period, he would go around from individual to individual, inviting them to Islam, and someone from the background would come screaming, do not listen to this man. Do not listen to this man. He is a liar. Who was that? It was Abu Lahab calling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam a liar as he was performing his da'wah during the Hajj period. Now the Hajj period moved on. And the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam he continued his da'wah. And so did the, the companions radiyallahu ta'ala anhum. Now the scholars they say there were three main tactics that the people of Quraysh used to stifle da'wah, to stop the da'wah. And there are lessons that we learn from this because these same tactics that, are, that were used by the people of Quraysh are also being used today. And we'll relate that insha'Allah. Now, the first thing that the scholars mention in which the people of Quraysh were using so they can stifle da'wah is mockery and belittling the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Calling him names, calling him crazy and mocking the message. They would mock the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam so much so that it actually affected him. He affected the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa You know when someone calls you one name, you, you, you got thick skin, you move on. And then twice, three times, four times. How many times is it going to occur until something would actually enter your heart? And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he addresses this in the Quran. And he says, وَلَقَدْ نَعْلَمُ أَنَّكَ يَضِيقُ صَدْرُكَ بِمَا يَقُولُونَ فَسَبِّحْ بِحَمْدِ رَبِّكَ وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ وَاعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, indeed, we know that something in your heart has occurred and it started to restrict from what you have been hearing and, and what the people have been saying about you. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he gives the remedy to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he says, praise Allah azza wa jal, reminding him of his purpose, that we are here to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then he says, وَكُمْ مِنَ السَّاجِدِينَ And be of those who prostrate. Prostrate, reminding yourself that the purpose for your existence is to remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to worship Him. So in these deep and trialing times, you find comfort and you find solace once you are in the closest position with Allah, and that is in your sujood. And then he says, وَاعْبُدْ رَبَّكَ حَتَّى يَأْتِيَكَ الْيَقِينَ And continuously worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until the truth comes. And what is the truth? That is death. When death comes and awaits you. So you non-stop pray until you go, uh, you non-stop in worship, يعني, in, in the worship of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in your life until the truth meets you, which is death. So my brothers, and, my brothers in Islam, this mocking and this belittling, which was a tactic of the people of Quraysh so they can stifle the da'wah and stop the da'wah, is what happens today. What happens today? You have people who mock our deen. They mock Islam. They make fun of Islam. They make fun of the adherers to Islam. They make fun of Muslims. Now, it's not just Muslims. It's faith in general. What do you hear? They say things like, it's the 21st century. And we have people who still believe in angels. Right? They're mocking angels. Mocking the existence of angels. Others would mock the existence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is prevalent in our society. Mocking our deen and mocking the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as we have seen with the caricatures in, the, in France and the likes. So, my brothers in Islam, this tactic is used again. 
just a little bit more sophisticated. It comes in different forms, but it's a bit more sophisticated. Another tactic that the people of Quraysh would use so they can stifle da'wah, so they can stop the message of Islam from reaching all the people that it needs to reach is that they would instill doubts in the hearts of people. The people of Quraysh, they would instill doubts in the hearts of people before they would receive this message or even after they received this message. So what they would, what they would do is they would say things like, come out with rumors. They say, baliftarahu. This prophet that you, uh, that you claim to be a prophet, they say that he would go to sleep at night, he would have a dream, and he would wake up in the morning and he would tell you all about this dream. And this is where he says that this revelation came from. They say he's making this all up because it happens in his dream. And this is incorrect. And of course the Quran came and it rebuttaled every single one of these rumors and every single one of these uh, misinformations that were, uh, ca were casting doubt upon the believers and those who didn't believe or who, di who had not accepted Islam as of yet. Now, other things that I would say is إِنَّمَا يُعَلِّمُهُ بَشَرُ Indeed, a person he meets with, he is the one who teaches the Prophet Muhammad everything. It doesn't come with a, as a unique thing that he, come, he comes with. No, no. It's another person that he's meeting with and he's teaching him everything. This is another doubt that they would cast amongst the believers. Another thing they would say is that a jinn or a shaitan has possessed the Prophet Muhammad and this jinn and shaitan is what's giving him all of this information. Again, casting doubts in the hearts and the minds of the, of the believers and those who have not accepted Islam. They said that the prophecy is too noble for a human being. They said the, top, the, the prophecy is too noble for a human being. It must be that it has to come from an angel. It has to come from an angel. Because prophecy itself is too noble for a human being. They came out and they doubted. They, made, they, they instilled doubt in the hearts of the believers. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He replies in the Quran to every single one of these. That I'm not going to go into inshallah. But nevertheless, they would instill doubts into the hearts of the believers. Now, this was their second tactic. How does this occur today? They instill doubts in the hearts of the believers and those who have not accepted Islam as of yet. When someone is asked about Islam, not a Muslim, talking about a non-Muslim, and you were to ask them, what's the first thing that comes to mind when you hear the word Islam or Muslim? A lot of the times you hear the word terrorist. Why? Because they have casted doubt in the hearts and the minds of people to believe that Islam and Muslims are terrorists and this is the way that the religion teaches its, its, its adherers to be extremist violent people, right? Casting doubt in the hearts of the, of the people. They would uh, cast doubts when it comes to the hijab. They say that women are oppressed. They come out and they say that women in Islam are oppressed. And Islam oppresses women. So they cast doubts in the hearts of, and the minds of people. They're coming out with all of these doubtful matters that make you think, hang on a minute, is that really true? Is that really our deen? Is that really Islam? So that again, another tactic that, is, that was used by the people of Quraysh, yet still used in a, in a slightly different form, just a bit more sophisticated. That's all it is. They're using the same tactics they would use to stifle the da'wah during the time of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and they're still using it today. Because the batil, the evil and the wrongdoers go around in the same circle. They've got the same tactics. They go around in the same circle. So before we mentioned that the belittling and the mockery, and then we've, we've got the, uh, the instilling doubts. And finally, the scholars mentioned the third thing that the, uh, that the people of Quraysh would use so they can stifle da'wah, was that they would stop people from listening to the Qur'an. They knew the words of Allah, they had an effect. It wouldn't just enter the, the ear, it would penetrate the heart. So much so that these leaders who got together and they were coming up with a plan so they can counter the, the message of Islam at night time, they would go and listen to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam reciting the Quran from his house. They loved it. It had something. It was beautiful. It would penetrate the heart. So they said, okay, we can't allow people to listen to the Quran. If they listen to the Quran, they're going to get this message. We have to distract them. So when the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam would recite the Quran, or he would be praying next to the Kaaba, here, the people of Quraysh would rush 
so they can distract people from listening to the Quran. How would they do this? When there was a gathering around the Prophet Muhammad who were listening to the Quran, they would introduce a fitna. They would create some sort of commotion, some sort of uh, action that would get people to argue. They would get people to move away from listening to the Quran. This is one way. Another way was that they would get someone with a musical instrument and they would get them to play this musical instrument next to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They would begin to dance, they would begin to play some games. So people get distracted from listening to the Qur'an and they would run to listening to this music and playing and, ga and games and dancing and all of these things. This is what they did so they can stifle da'wah, so they can stop the message of Islam from spreading. Now how is that happening today? I believe this is probably the one that is happening not, not on a daily basis, not on an hourly basis, but wallahi by every second. Every time you open up your phone, any one of us, and they scroll through our Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, whatever it is, right? Everything that's out there. We're scrolling, even on WhatsApp. If you're not listening to a song, you're listening to something about a song. And if you're not listening to something about a song, you're listening with something that has music in the background. And this music is distracting us from listening to the Quran. This music is keeping us away from listening to the words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The message that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent to us as revelation. We're no longer connected to the Quran because our hearts have become full of this evil that has entered our souls. Wallahi, these tactics that have been used by the people of Quraysh and they are continue, these tactics are continuing to be used by those who fight Islam and they don't want the message of Islam to spread. It's happening today, just a bit more sophisticated. My dear respected brothers in Islam, I remind you and I remind myself to fear no one except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to not die except in the state of Islam which is submission to Allah Azza wa Jal. My dear respected brothers in Islam, the people of Quraysh had three main tactics to stifle da'wah and to stop it. One, they would make mockery of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and make mockery of the deen. And this is happening today by name calling Muslims, by, uh, by mocking Islam and the message that it has come with. And the second thing is that they would instill doubts in the hearts and the minds of the believers. And this is also occurring today. And the final thing that the, uh, the, the, the main tactics yani, that the people of Quraysh would use is that they would stop people from listening to the Qur'an. And this is also occurring today in a very sophisticated manner, in a very targeted way. So my brothers in Islam, the reason why I bring this to light is that when we know what is being used to stifle da'wah, to stop the message of Islam, then at least we know how to overcome these challenges when we are faced with them on a day-to-day -day basis. We can work out that, hang on a minute, does this stop the, uh, stop the da'wah? Is there something behind whatever I'm engaging in right now? Right? So whatever it is in the fact that if it's da'wah that's supposed to be reaching me, or it's because I am supposed to be giving da'wah to someone else, right? There's da'wah that's being stopped and it's being stifled and it is occurring day and night, day and night. You know, I, was, I came across something called Hasbara. Hasbara is an application that, um, that the Zionists have put together so they can have an army of social media warriors and keyboard warriors so they can attack Islamic channels, attack channels in specific that are speaking about Palestine, right? Which is an Islamic cause. This is happening on a daily basis, right? They're trying to stop the da'wah. They're trying to stop the message of Islam. This is just one very small aspect of what's happening out there in the world. So my brothers in, my brothers in Islam, there are people out there who want to stop the da'wah. But it's not, all, it's not all pessimistic. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he went through all of this, through all of these tactics, and was his message successful? By Allah it was. And your message, inshaAllah, that you're going to be passing to the world, the message of Islam will continue. And you will continue doing your job, your da'wah, 
and it will never end. And you will overcome these adversities. You will overcome these challenges. You will overcome all of these methods that have been used to stifle da'wah. Why? Because you are a follower of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And just as the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam succeeded, you will also succeed insha'Allah. We have Allah azza wa jalla on our side. We have the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam as our way, as our example, and we will follow, follow this insha'Allah ta'ala.